All right, Melanie, if you are good, I think we can get started. I am ready to go. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to start with just some housekeeping. I'm going to give a really brief overview of who our organization is, and then I'm going to turn it over to Melanie, do an introduction, and then really let her just do the whole presentation about benefits counseling. So welcome to the webinar. If you are new to Zoom webinars, there are a few different pieces to know about. One, your microphone is already muted, so don't worry about that. Two, your video should not beyond we can't see you so that's a little different for us um, but just in case you're worried about kind of kind of what we're seeing or what we're hearing we're not seeing or hearing anything on your end we can interact via the chat so in the chat box you have an option you can pick who you send messages to as well you can send it to all panelists and then all panelists and attendees so sometimes i know folks have resources that they're sharing um, so if you want to use all attendees for that you totally can there's also a q a where you can put in some questions if you have them. And then I can either type answers back to you or I will save them and have Melanie answer them if they seem relevant. And you also have the option to get in touch with us after the webinar. The other piece to know is the webinar is being recorded. So if you have a question, I will not say who the question is from if I say it out loud. Um, I know that's sometimes always a little awkward. Like if you have a question, you don't want everyone to know you're the one asking the question, especially if we're talking about benefits. So just know that is what I will do. So feel free to ask questions um, and I will not broadcast who you are when asking the questions. Let's see, I think I've covered most everything. I will send out a captioned version of this webinar later this week. I'll also send some follow-up resources and a survey just to get your feedback. This is the first time our organization has had kind of a guest speaker come on and do a really specific resource webinar. So I'm really excited and I'd love to get your feedback. And Melanie, so you know, I'm looking at the attendees and we have a mix of people. There's some people from the K to 12 system, some teachers in high school, some folks from transition. There's some folks from chapters of the ARC. There are several parents, some current college students that are on, some folks from DVR. Um, so a bunch of different people are on. So I think that'll be great and it'll be relevant for lots of people. So that's my housekeeping. If you have other questions, let me know. I am now gonna switch into kind of an introduction of who I am, who the Colorado Initiative for Inclusive Higher Education is, and then turn it over to today's webinar. So my name is Shelby Bates. I work for IN, or the Colorado Initiative for Inclusive Higher Education. We're a nonprofit that advocates for inclusion of students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in higher education. So kind of within the college system, whether that's community college, university, so on. My position specifically is education and outreach, really focusing on the K-12 system, letting teachers and students and parents know that college is now possible for students with intellectual disabilities. There are supports in place at Arapahoe Community College, University of Northern Colorado, and University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. What makes these options unique, um, if, if you're not already familiar with them, they are kind of newer. They started in 2016 is that students do not need to meet the traditional entry criteria, so they don't need a specific high school GPA or specific classes. They don't need to have taken the SAT or ACT. It's really designed for students who previously haven't had the option to go to college. And then the other piece is once students are enrolled, they receive a lot of additional supports. For example, within academics, students can access modifications in addition to the traditional college accommodations. Um, so they can also get some support in terms of vocational goals. Students are working on resumes and on cover letters, on interview skills, having internships and other work experiences while they're in college. And I'll say I think that piece is a big reason that we connected with Melanie to talk about benefits counseling. A lot of parents and students have concerns around if I go to college and I start to work, how does that impact my benefits? And I think whether or not you go to college, that's still a question. Um, so that's a big reason for the webinar today is to kind of address that fear that families might have around going to college, starting employment, and what that impact looks like. And then the other piece with inclusive higher education is just being social on campus like any other college student would be. There are peer mentors who are other college students who are on the college campus working with students to kind of build some of that social engagement. That's my very brief overview. 
If you want to know more, if it's brand new to you, I will send out some info after the webinar. I'm going to do an upcoming webinar that's kind of updates on inclusive higher education in Colorado. And you're always welcome to email me, send any questions you have. We can set up a time to chat individually, whatever you want. But that is just the very brief overview and kind of how we got connected to Melanie. So in terms of who is Melanie, <laughs> Melanie is a curriculum developer and trainer with the Colorado Office of Employment First. If you hadn't heard of them, they're a little newer in Colorado, but doing some really exciting work. She entered the world of benefits counseling in 2003 with a certification from Virginia Commonwealth University. She has since worked to provide Colorado communities and persons with disabilities and their families information around benefits and employment. This includes eligibility for social security disability benefits, so SSDI and SSI, how to start and navigate the application process for these benefits, how work and other life decisions affect a person's individual benefit situation. And with the Office of Employment First, Melanie is working to improve benefits counseling awareness, service provision, and capacity in the state of Colorado and for all persons with disabilities. So our hope today is that you really walk away with a sense of what is benefits counseling, how do you access it, why it might be relevant to you. So again, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and then at the end, we'll have some time, hopefully, to answer some of those. If you have really specific questions, we might say you might want to chat with a benefits counselor, but we'll kind of cross that bridge as we get there. So thanks so much, Melanie. We are so excited. Oh, I also want to say that Melanie is the one who reached out to Inn and really kind of brought the awareness to us, um, the Tracy and I, about what this all looks like and why it's so important. So it's been really great to learn about. And I'm excited for this presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Shelby. Um, you can hear me okay? I'm going to say yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. And then your, yeah, then your picture went away. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Melanie. And uh, the picture on the screen is what I look like when I'm not sitting at home giving, giving presentations. Um, but uh, Shelby gave my bio, and so I'm here to share some information about benefits counseling with you. I've been doing this a long time, and I really believe in the service. And so um, I want to I wanna do my own housekeeping item here. Um, I do have two dogs in the house, and if I'm talking for the next about an hour, uh, a little over an hour, and um, they don't bark, I'm going to be extremely happy. They are both sleeping right now, but I want to just give a forewarning just in case. Um, they, they'll probably be fine, to be honest, but if um, FedEx or UPS comes to the house, they may not be. So I can't predict that. Um, the other thing I want to say is that you're going to be seeing throughout this presentation a lot of contact information, resources, and as Shelby mentioned, she's going to be sending those out. I'm going to be, I'll give those to her after the presentation today in a nice little package, and you'll get those uh, for your future use. So as we're going through slides, as you're listening to me speak, um, don't feel like you have to um, hurry and get your cell phone and take a picture of the screen and you don't have to feverishly write anything down. You will get that information from, from today's presentation. So please feel free to uh, focus on the presentation and send in those questions in the chat box or the Q&A uh, to Shelby. She'll be monitoring, to, monitoring that uh, on my behalf today. So thank you again for that, Shelby. Um, so let's get into who I work for first, just to give you a little bit of background of where I'm coming from. Um, I work for the Colorado Office of Employment First. Uh, we are do, doing some exciting things, as Shelby mentioned. And our vision there is to really uh, promote an, a, a culture of inclusive, meaningful, and competitive employment for all people, regardless of disability. Our mission is to lead Colorado towards that equitable employment and reaching all people through collaboration, systems innovation, and training excellence. Those are our strategies to get there. We really believe uh, that competitive integrated employment is the ultimate and achievable goal for all people, regardless of disability or not. So two of the areas that we're focusing on to improve those outcomes for people with disabilities are youth and families and benefits counseling. Uh, those are two of, two of other, many other areas, but those are the two I wanna briefly touch on today because I'm thinking we might hit a new audience uh, with those of you that are on the call today. 
So with youth and families, um, to impact employment, we're looking at youth and families in the systems of healthcare, employment, and education. In healthcare, we know that employment is a social determinant of health. You're gonna hear me say that term in relation to benefits counseling later on in the presentation. And employment contributes to the overall health and well being of, of any individual. For people with disabilities, as they start planning and preparing to move in and throughout the adult healthcare system, employment really is not often incorporated into that process. And so, one thing we're working on, uh, my colleague Teresa Nguyen, you'll get her contact information here soon. Um, she's working on developing a fish physician toolkit to help guide that transition conversation where employment is integrated into that healthcare planning. In the employment realm, we're working on strategies and resource development to communicate that employment can be an expectation and a possibility to youth and families. The Youth Employment Advisory Council is one thing that, um, that we are doing. And it was informed and put into place, uh, or will be put into place because of community listening sessions that happened back in April. And that really provided feedback to have more self advocates and role models engaged in our work at, at COEF. Uh, so this September, COEF will engage with young adults through listening sessions to get input, get their input on preparing for employment and employment opportunities. And the goal of that group really is to develop an advisory from those listening sessions of interested and, and young leaders that really want to be involved. And so um, that will be an opportunity for, um, for you or for someone that you support uh, to be involved. Uh, it, Jennifer uh, Stewart, the other, another colleague that you will get the contact information for here shortly. Uh, she is the Colorado Department of Education and the Division of Voc Rehab liaison to the Colorado Office of Employment First. And she is going to ensure that we're all communicating the same message. She's working closely with the Department of Education and DVR to support building capacity among educators and DVR staff around the transition planning process. So this fall, she will be facilitating learning communities for interagency um, learning communities. So that will be another opportunity that's coming up. She's also uh, done some work and continues to do some work on products and trainings that are going to help raise awareness about employment as an expectation for youth. Uh, we just released the first two youth focused brochures and there will be more to come and um, Shelby got those brochures and maybe sent them out, but you can access those through her or through um, the Office of Employment First as well. Um, we really want uh, families and people with disabilities to know employment can be a possibility and it should be a conversation that that starts early. So my coworkers that are working on those initiatives are Teresa Nguyen and Jennifer Stewart. Their contact information is here, but like I said, you don't need to fever, feverishly write that down or take any uh, phone photos. Uh, you'll get that in your resource packet from today. In regards to benefits counseling, this is uh, my area. <laughs> uh, this is what Colorado Office of Employment First is working on. First, we wanna increase the knowledge base of benefits counseling statewide. That's the what, the when, the why, the how of benefits counseling. That's what we're gonna start covering today. People often understand the importance of knowing that work can affect benefits whether it's the well-known benefits or, or a lesser local known benefit. Um, and they know that that information exists. They understand that it's a scary, scary topic. There's a lot of uncertainty around what really happens and what's really available and what isn't. And so it's important to get people, to get families and support systems to a certified benefits counseling provider 
so they can truly understand how to make an informed decision on employment and on improving their financial well-being because they've gotten the, the full amount of information that, that they need to get. So that's the, one of the first things we're working on. Um, the next thing I'm working on is to increase resources. We wanna increase accessible, easily understood resources around benefits for people with disabilities and for our communities. Um, that will help with some of the misinformation out there, which we're also gonna tackle a little bit today. And this also about increasing resources for those out providing day-to-day -day benefits counseling services. And by providing resources for those individuals, it helps them provide an, a more effective benefits counseling service, which helps everybody um, overall in the long run. The next thing we're working on is increasing capacity. And by capacity, we mean the, the number of people providing benefits counseling services in our state. Uh, we're working to increase capacity in Colorado. And that, of course, again, will ultimately uh, support those receiving the service and getting the most effective service. And it's going to ultimately support those providing the service to be able to provide the time and energy to get that best service provided. And that, of course, makes it the most effective. And we'll talk about what happens when someone gets the most effective benefits counseling service and what positive influences that have. Um, we'll do that in a few slides. And then uh, lastly, we're going to increase access. Uh, we're working to increase access to those communities and areas that really have limited access to service provision in general, whether it's employment services, benefits counseling services, any kinds of services, and to those populations that are typically underserved as well. So part of this is going to be first educating communities, individuals, agencies about what benefits counseling is, and how it can truly support an informed choice on employment, and then ultimately how that influences positively people's community integration and, and being independent um, in their lives. And all of this will go back to the idea of work as a social determinant of happiness and increased bank accounts. So we'll, we'll hear that term a little bit later too. One thing I really want to mention because it's just started and it's exciting and even though we're a little over a year from rollout, I want to make sure everybody's aware that Colorado is getting an online benefit estimator and an employment resource tool all tied into one and that's called DB 101. DB 101 is in nine states. Colorado will be the 10th. And DB 101 stands for Disability Benefits 101. In fact, way, way, way back in the day when they first were launching this, it was called Disability Benefits 101. But we've shortened that. It's called DB 101 now. We are under contract uh, with the vendor to get this, to get production started in Colorado. And we expect a, a public full rollout in November of 2021. So why is this important? Why can it have a positive influence for people? with disabilities. With DB 101, anyone can explore the world of work through the online estimators. They can play around with how, if they wanted to work and earn $25 an hour, how that might affect an SSDI payment or SSI. Um, it gives 24-7, 365 opportunity to do that, to explore the world of work. They can explore it anonymously. Um, they don't have to uh, do it anonymously. You can put your specific information in as well. And it, you can tie that to your benefits. There's also lots and lots of resource tools. Um, you can find out all, about all kinds of resources, whether you're at home in a stay-at-home order or whether you're just curious. Um, lots of resources available and then our online estimators as well. Now, specific to Colorado, uh, we will be f uh, featuring the main SSI and SSDI estimators. We will also have a Medicaid buy-in estimator. We're going to talk about Medicaid buy-in a little bit later in this presentation. And then we're going to have a Spanish version as well. So those are the important big Colorado features that, that we'll have. Um, right now, we are starting, well, I guess we're in August. 
Uh, right now we're starting uh, getting scheduled some kickoffs and kickoffs is just getting the word out to different um, groups of people. Those will be happening in August and September of this year and beyond where we're getting the word out again about what DB 101 is, how it's going to be beneficial, how people can be involved. And so if you want to be involved, be sure to reach out. You're going to have my contact information um, and ways to, to find out that information. And I, I am literally collecting names on a massive spreadsheet to make sure that people are invited to these kickoffs. So it's exciting times in Colorado. Again, I know it's over a year from the full rollout, but um, you can be involved in and hear about our progress um, as, as we go through it. If you want to see a brief glimpse or a, like what another state has, the website to do that is on the bottom of this slide, db101.org. The other nine states are listed there and you can go explore uh, what each state has. Um, each state can customize to their state and so Colorado won't look like any one of those states specifically, but you can um, mess around on it and see, see what's coming to Colorado. So again, come get involved. We'd love to have you a part of the process. So to get to know the Colorado Office of Employment first, um, we have a website that is, I think, launching this week or possibly next week. Um, right now, it's just the face of the website, employmentfirstcolorado.org. It's also in the upper left-hand corner of every slide you'll see from me today. Um, it's a great place to go get resources to find out what the Colorado Office of Employment First is working on and uh, to provide your information and feedback or ask questions. Um, you can reach out to any of our staff directly or you can contact us info at employmentfirstcolorado.org for that email or that phone number that's listed there. Um, you can get signed up for our newsletter. That's gonna be starting this month as well. It'll come out every once every two months or every other month, I should say. And you can get signed up for our email listserv, which we send out a lot of resources, information. Uh, we've done a lot of COVID-19 related information um, since the kind of start of that. And so um, great place for resources. Uh, get signed up. We would love to have you be a part of that. So that's the Colorado Office of Employment First. That's not why I came today. <laughs> um, I think it's great information for you to have, but let's get into the nitty gritty. So benefits counseling couple of uh, more housekeeping items here. Uh, we're going to be covering, I'm going to be covering a lot of information today. And depending on your level of exposure to benefits counseling, benefits and work, depending on your level of exposure to that type of information, some of the information that we talk about today may feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, I tried to keep it very basic, but when it comes to benefits and government and work, there's a lot of acronyms in there. And so um, if it does feel overwhelming, don't feel bad and don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to figure this out because I am gonna give you the resources today so you can ask questions and get more information um, down the road and forever. <laughs> uh, again, questions or um, comments in the chat or the Q&A. And if there are questions, comments, things to address that I can't get to today based on time or based because I just don't know the answer. Um, I'll be getting those from Shelby and um, gladly get those answers out to the whole group so um, everybody can benefit from the question that you ask. Now, there were um, a, several, a fair amount of pregame questions, we'll call them that, that came to Shelby and she was able to give to me prior to today's presentation. So I have done my best to include that information in today's presentation. That being said, if you feel like you're not 100% sure if you got the answer that you wanted uh, or were looking for or needed, or that I missed your question, please feel free to reach out again through Shelby or directly to myself and I will get those answered. So, so today's takeaways, like Shelby mentioned, the what, the why, the when, the how, the basics about benefits counseling. We're gonna jump right into the first question and what is it? So, what is benefits counseling? Benefits counseling, you may hear also called benefits planning. And it's a service that helps individuals with disabilities, their families, their support systems, really understand how employment and other life decisions like education 
will impact their benefits. Now, when I say benefits, I want us to all be sure that we're all thinking about the same type of thing. Benefits in this discussion is really, um, I've lifted, uh, listed examples here. The two big ones that most everybody's gonna know about or have heard of before are SSDI and SSI. Those more acronyms uh, stand for SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance and SSI is Supplemental Security Income. Like I said, those are the two big ones, um, the, people, the ones that people probably have the most questions about. But benefits counseling covers other benefits as well. A few other examples here um, are SNAP, uh, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, um, also known as food stamps, that's the easier way to say it. Medicare, uh, Medicaid in our state, we have, I believe it's just over 40 doorways into the Medicaid program. And so that's a lot of different options to talk about when it comes to a person's benefit scenario and how their life decisions are gonna affect that. And like I said, there's many, many more. Low income energy assistance, child care assistance program, the list goes on and on. But benefits counseling addresses any one person's unique benefit scenario. So what can you expect in benefits counseling? Benefits counseling provides a clear, personalized plan. And because it's clear, because it's personalized to that one person's benefit scenario, it can really help address the fears, the concerns that a lot of people have about a reduction in benefits or a loss of benefits. If they choose work or if they choose education or um, any other life decision, it really is about providing those individuals the opportunity to make a fully informed choice because they have all the information in front of them so that helps them pursue employment, pursue education, and um, pursue their life goals. Now that clear personalized plan is called a benefit summary and analysis or BSA. And I chose not to put that on this slide because you don't need to know the name of that plan. Just know that if you see a benefits uh, counselor, this is an option that they have to provide you. Um, and if that's gonna take everything, put it on paper basically. So now what to expect in that clear personalized plan? The, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a few of the things that you're gonna get when you see a benefits counselor. First, verification of benefits. This is one of the most important because uh, I can't, I've been doing this work a long time and a high percentage of the individuals that come in to see you um, really aren't, aren't truly aware of what benefits they're on. They might be aware that they get a check each month. They might be aware of approximately what date that comes in, in on. Uh, they might say they're on, I'm on SSI benefits and my check is 1200 a month. I know based on that statement that that's not correct. And so it's really about taking the information that you give them as a beneficiary and then verifying that through the source. And so Social Security, SSI, and SSDI benefits are gonna be verified through the Social Security Administration. Food stamps, Medicaid are gonna be verified through Department of Human Services, um, healthcare policy and financing, uh, those types of agencies. So, so the verification comes from the source. Also what you can expect from a benefits counselor is you may need long-term support or support over time, depending on uh, what your goals are and how your life is changing. And that long-term support can be provided and that need will be determined as you meet with your benefits counselor. <clears throat> if your job changes, if, you're, if you decide to go, the, um, to go take some college, go take some college, to go get uh, your education and your degree, um, and then you're gonna transition into employment, those are all reasons that long-term support might be, um, that the need might be, be determined. So that can be provided as well. Also, everybody, everybody comes in and their benefit scenario is complicated. That's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, there might be overpayments. There might be these weird letters that come in from, might be, there will be these weird letters that come in from social security that really almost have hidden meaning. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll take a quick drink here. Um, those are benefit scenarios that 
a benefits counselor can help you understand as well, kind of to unravel that knot and understand why things are happening the way they are. Um, benefits counselor is also going to help you understand how earnings and your goal for earnings <coughs> is going to affect each benefit in your scenario and how that all fits together in your full picture. And that's really where you're going to get that informed choice. <coughs> and then lastly, but not least, it's really important and it's, it's pointless to get all that information if you don't report wages to the agencies that manage your benefits. And so they're going to help you understand how you report wages for each benefit and when to do that and why it's important. So again, not an, not an exhaustive list, <coughs> but a list of some of the uh, things you can expect when you meet with a benefits counselor. So that's the what. Now we're gonna get into the why. Why benefits counseling? So many reasons. <laughs> so benefits counseling um, is important because benefits are often either the sole or a high percentage of the economic stability which is related to mental and physical well-being for any one person. SSI and SSDI, those two big benefits, are often the sole income. And those provide basic needs for any person. And it provides access to health insurance. And those things are, are huge for a person's overall health and well-being. Other programs like Medicaid waivers, for example, um, other types of health coverage, um, other benefits like low-income energy assistance, um, child care uh, assistance program that I mentioned before, food stamps, Medicare, those are all uh, programs that provide either specialized or certain services and benefits, maybe a cash payment, that promote individuals living in their communities, living independently, integrating um, in their communities. And so those are important pieces to a person's uh, life and their, like I said, they're an economic and health stability. <clears throat> and why benefits counseling? Because work. Why work? We all have to work. And work, whether it's paid or unpaid, studies show that it's good for our health and well-being. It is that social, a social determinant of health. Studies show that work improves people's happiness, people's confidence and self-esteem, and then most of all, people's bank accounts. If you work, think of why you work. I work because I like my house and I wanna pay for it. I like to order in food and eat takeout food on my couch. I have to pay for that. Um, I like my car. So I pay for my car. We all make those choices and work helps us do that, um, make those choices. And people, regardless of disability, should have that opportunity to pursue work and a better financial position. Uh, people that are on benefits alone are in poverty. There's no sugarcoating that. They're in poverty. And if that doesn't change, they're going to stay in poverty. And they should know, we all should know, that that doesn't have to be the only option. And there's programs and benefits counseling out there to help help you understand that. And some more why study stuff. Uh, the studies have shown, um, studies sponsored by the Social Security Administration and, and a couple other agencies, um, have shown that effective benefits counseling helps people achieve employment in greater numbers, more quickly, and with significant greater improvement in earnings. That of course has a positive impact on improved employment outcomes. A person is more likely to choose a career versus getting just the next job that's gonna pay the, the bill that is overdue. Um, so there's more long-term career planning. Less recidivism, that means less return to benefits or less reliance on benefits, that's the next bullet point, and less uh, return to programs, employment support programs like DVR. It does reduce dependence on benefits, I've mentioned that, and then there is an overall cost savings for the Social Security Administration. So they also recognize the importance of benefits counseling. 
And then probably the biggest, the biggest thing here is the myths. And there's so many myths out there. I've heard some crazy ones over the years. Um, and I, if you have any myths that you want to share, or you're not sure about, type them in the chat. Um, we'd be happy to address those. I'm going to address three of them here today that um, I've probably heard the most over my career. Um, and we're going to myth bust. And this is why benefits counseling too. First misconception, you have to limit your earnings to under $1,000 a month if you're on SSDI. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to keep your SSDI payment. That is a misconception. Now, this, this slide is going to look like there's a lot of information on here. Just remember, you don't have to know all of this, and this isn't all encompassing. This is just to break the misconception or bust it, bust the myth. Um, if you're on SSDI, again, that's Social Security Disability Insurance, you can try work for a minimum of nine months with absolutely no effect on your SSDI cash payment. You could walk out, get a job tomorrow. It's going to pay you $20,000 a month, $150,000 a year. In the first nine months, you're going to get your full SSDI cash payment. Simple as that. The name of that program is called the trial work period. You won't need to know that. Your benefits counselors will know that, but that's the program that gives you nine months, earn whatever you want, no effect on your SSDI because of work. Um, on top of that, you can also get an additional three months where your SSDI payment is not affected regardless of your earnings. Um, that's another program called cessation and grace period. Again, just throwing the term out there. You may hear it again. Um, but those two together give you a first year of unlimited earnings with no effect on your benefit. So nice and simple there. That, that breaks that misconception. Uh, the, the next thing that breaks that mis, myth, <laughs> misconception is that beyond that nine months, you're not going to lose eligibility for your SSDI because of work for three years. So that means like after that point, you could get your check one month and not the next month, but you're not going to lose eligibility. And that's a, that's a key um, incentive for people because oftentimes when a person applies for benefits, it's a nightmare. It is uh, literally a nightmare. And you go through years uh, and appeals. Typically, um, it's, it's a system or a process that really kind of, you know, hammers you in the head saying, you can't work, you can't work, you can't work. And then these opportunities come up and you don't want to go through that process again. So you're going to maintain eligibility. You don't have to reapply for benefits to get that check back. Um, and that's beyond the nine months. That's three years. So there's almost four years of eligibility coverage and a year's worth of payment coverage. So again, busting that myth. And then the third thing that I'm going to mention today is that if your earnings are under $1,260 gross per month, if you're a non-blind individual, then you're still going to get your SSDI payment. Um, and so that breaks the myth because that $1,260 number is higher than the thousand. And um, that number is specific to 2020. And so that number will change in 2021 or I'm assuming it will change in 2021. Uh, and then there is a different number for individuals that are blind by social security definition. So those are just some side notes. But again, we busted that myth. You can actually earn way more than $1,000 to try work on SSDI, and then you're still not, you're going to maintain your eligibility for quite a bit longer than that. There's more that to, that, um, to that series of incentives than what we're talking about today. So again, a good reason if you're on SSDI to go see a benefits counselor and you have those questions or curiosities. So the next misconception, you, got to, you, you have to keep a minimum of $1 in SSI to keep your Medicaid. In Colorado, we have an automatic tie between SSI eligibility and Medicaid eligibility, and that's SSI Medicaid. Remember, um, I mentioned before, there's a lot of different doorways into the Medicaid program in Colorado. Um, this is one of them. And so 
The misconception out there is you got to keep some of that SSI payment to keep Medicaid. SSI goes through a calculation, and we're not going to talk about the calculation today, um, but your benefits counselor will know that calculation and can run it through your scenario. But going through that calculation really shows how your work income affects how much you're, you're going to get in SSI. So if you run through that calculation, there's always a point. It's called the break-even point. Again, you won't need to know that term, but there's always a point where you have earned enough that you're no longer going to get an SSI payment. It's not even a dollar in SSI. It's zero. Um, that is at a point where another program kicks in, and in Colorado, you can re still receive the Medicaid that you got with SSI, and you can earn up to $34,484 gross per year and still keep your Medicaid. That 34,484 number is specific to Colorado and it is specific to the year 2020. Um, again, those numbers will adjust. There's kind of a, a little calculation, I don't know if calculation is the right word. There's some numbers that are looked at to determine that number for each state. So that's specific to Colorado. $34,484 gross per year is $16.57 an hour if you are working hourly. That's working 40 hours a week. So that gives you an idea of what, where that number um, falls. So pursue your college education. Don't limit your goals. Go for that career because this is just one way to have medical coverage in Colorado. There are other ways. And that's gonna lead us to our third misconception that we're gonna to cover today. That misconception is that individuals that receive Medicaid can't keep Medicaid once they start working. Well, we already know that's not true because SSI Medicaid gets to keep it um, when they're working. And in our state, Working adults between the ages of 16 and 64, again, you have to be working to access this program, um, you have a qualifying disability and you meet the income requirements, have access to the Colorado Medicaid buy-in program. Now, a couple of points. Having a qualifying disability, what the heck does that mean? If you've qualified for SSI or SSDI benefits, if, if Social Security says, yes, you have a disability, then you have a qualifying disability for Colorado Medicaid or the Medicaid buy-in program. If you haven't been through that process and you, don't, you wanna know if you would qualify, then uh, the Medicaid buy-in program has their own process that you would go through. You don't have to apply for Social Security benefits to get this program or to have access to it. The income requirements. Um, they only look at your income. They're not gonna look at your families, whether you're married, you um, have children, they're, not, they're gonna look at your income only. And you can actually earn in the Colorado Medicaid buy-in program up to $4,684 per month. That's after the standard exclusions that Medicaid buy-in has. And you can purchase Medicaid in our state. Now, Exclusions, what does that term mean? Exclusions are, are um, things that they're dollar amounts, they're things that the Medicaid buy-in program kind of pretends they're not there. They don't count that income or that um, cost that you have. And so the standard exclusions for Colorado Medicaid buy-in program actually let you earn or allow you to earn up to $9,453 per month and still qualify for the Colorado Medicaid buy-in program. Now, one more key term about the Medicaid buy-in program is it's buy-in. I mean, listen to that term, you have to buy-in. And so you will pay a premium, or you may, I should say, you may pay a premium based on a sliding fee scale. So it's possible that you would have a $0 monthly premium and you could purchase Medicaid. And you could have as high of a premium as $200 per month to purchase that Medicaid. And there's different <clears throat> categories. I think there's four, if I remember correctly, four or five, um, that whatever income bracket you fall in determines how much you're going to pay for that, that monthly premium to have Medicaid in Colorado. So um, that's the Medicaid buy-in program. Again, 
these three misconceptions are just three of many. And a few of the programs that we talk about in these three slides are three of many. So just remember, you don't have to know this information. That's why there's benefits counselors out there. And that's why benefits counseling is important. It's important because you want the right information and you want the full information. And that's the way to do it is through getting benefits counseling services. So in a nutshell, we'll just summarize uh, what we talked about in those three slides. SSDI, basically one year of unlimited earnings, $20,000 a month or whatever, um, and no effect on your SSDI payment due to work. Um, no effect on your SSDI payment at all if your earnings are under $1,260 gross per month. And even if you're over that amount, you can keep your eligibility for, remember, at least that three years. Um, now, that being said, I, I almost hate that bullet point. I do mention it because I think it's important, but I almost hate that bullet point because I don't want people to see that, oh, then I need to limit my earnings to under $1,260 gross per month. That is not, not necessarily the case. A benefits counselor is gonna help you understand if that's something that you do want to do, or they're gonna tell you about lots of other work incentives that we're not gonna talk about today based on time and, and complication, but. Um, they're going to talk about that with you and say, you know what, this job, you're going to earn $1,700 a month, but I know a way for Social Security to consider only $1,200 of that. Um, that's like an ex those exclusions. They'll pretend that $500 of, is, of it isn't there. And so those are the things that those benefits counselors are going to be able to talk with you about and help you kind of map out and, and use. With SSI, in a nutshell, with SSI, you can keep the medical coverage, the Medicaid, that's attached to it, up to $34,484 gross per year. And even if you're not receiving an SSI cash payment, so you have that Medicaid or medical coverage, and you're going to keep some level of your SSI payment, whether it's $5, what, $5 whether it's $200, whether it's $400, whatever the number is, you're going to keep some level of the SSI payment up to $1,651 gross per month from work. And that's based on that calculation that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so those are kind of the in, not, in the nutshell statements that you can think about if you're considering working and you're on SSDI and or SSI benefits. And then we'll summarize the medical coverage um, specific to Medicaid. Um, we haven't talked about Medicare, that's, a, that's another beast, but Medicare has great long-term coverage as well, and a lot of incentives with that. Um, but with Medicaid in Colorado, again, you can still keep Medicaid through SSI up to $34,484 gross per year, um, even if you're not getting that SSI payment. And we have access to that exciting Colorado Medicaid buy-in program that makes it possible for you to purchase Medicaid even with earnings up to $9,453 per month with those standard exclusions. So, um, hopefully that gives you an idea and some encouragement if you're considering work and you feel a little intimidated by the idea. Um, when you meet with a benefits counselor, it's important to remember that if you're, they're not reporting stuff to Social Security um, other than numbers and, uh, and things like that, but they're not going to call Social Security and say, hey, this person's thinking about work. You better monitor their account or watch their account. Benefits counselors don't have time for that and neither does Social Security. Um, they're gonna help you understand and help you make informed choices and really know how you can pursue your goals. So that's the what, or we covered the what, this is the why. We did some nutshells on those misconceptions all around benefits counseling. So now I want to address some of the other topics that you can discuss with your benefits counselor. And as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of this stuff comes from those pregame questions that I got through Shelby. Um, some of them that I wasn't able to uh, kind of shove into this presentation today because of their level of complication, that, the level of, I don't wanna say complication, I wanna say the level of complexity that needs to be thought about and the conversations that need to be had. 
Um, but these are conversations that you can have with your benefits counselor. So how will employment affect my SSI, my SSDI, my food stamps, whatever, what other benefits I'm on, my, my benefit scenario, what does that look like now? And what does that look like in the future? That's one of those things those benefits counselors are available for. What's gonna happen now in those long-term services? What's gonna happen as things change in the future? As I change my goals, as I change my mind, as I change jobs, as I um, sh uh, shift my focus, um, those are all things that your benefits counselors can address with you. Um, what happens when a person is drawing a benefit as a child or um, as a child beneficiary? You may, uh, the term that I, that I saw in the pregame questions, as well as the term that's in the field is CDB, another acronym, that stands for Childhood Disability Benefits or Beneficiary. Um, what if a person's drawing that benefit and the parent that they're drawing that benefit off of uh, retires? or they become disabled or pass away. Those are all ways that a parent or any one person opens up their social security retirement fund and that opens up access to benefits like retirement, disability, uh, survivor's benefits, there's a bunch of different terms. I don't want to get too complicated and I will get into the weeds before you know it. I get so passionate about this stuff. Um, what happens when a person is drawing that benefit and those things happen or what happens when a person's drawing on their own record and then one of these things happen? Those are all conversations that a benefits counselor can help you map out and explain to you. And if they don't know, they'll, they'll look it up. <laughs> That's how half the Half of what we learn as benefits counselors is running across scenarios that are unique or new to us. And we have to research it. It's the best way to learn. <laughs> um, another question that could come up is about ABLE accounts. I know you guys talk about ABLE accounts, your program. It's an awesome, awesome program. It could be its own, um, its own presentation. <laughs> we haven't had one yet. Um, and how do ABLE accounts really protect my benefits? Um, when does that happen? How does that work? And those are conversations, again, that you can have with your benefits counselor. Hey, Melanie, can I ask mm -hmm. you a question related to ABLE accounts, sort of? I have a yeah. couple questions about asset limits. So I don't know if you'd be able to say anything about asset limits related to SSI and SSDI um, or the relation to ABLE accounts, but I think maybe it'd be relevant here. So I thought I'd ask it. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> So a couple of different things. With SSI, yeah, there is asset limits. SSI um, is supplemental security income. Supplement is kind of a key word to focus on with that benefit because it supplements everything else. It's a payment of last resort. You have to be eligible for everything else and you have to take that before you can get SSI. The reason I say that is because it's supplemental. It's meant only to, to be the payment of last resort, to cover the basic needs. If you're eligible for that, they say you have to have limited income and resources, or limited resources, I should say. So any one individual can only have $2,000 in resources. And so that might be where an ABLE account comes into play. If they have, if you have some future goals around saving money for, things that you can pay for with an ABLE account. And I, I won't go into the list of that here, but um, education could be one of those. Um, the other thing is with SSDI, um, Bill Gates could get SSDI. That's probably the simplest way to think about SSDI. There's no resource limit per se um, to be eligible or to maintain eligibility with SSDI. It's social security, disability, insurance. Insurance is the key word there. It's like an insurance policy that you have paid into as a worker or someone else has paid into a worker as a worker and you can get that um, payment because of that insurance policy that you've paid for. And so there's not um, asset or resource limits that are tied to SSDI. Now with ABLE accounts, um, it's, it's a way to save money and the money that you're saving in that ABLE account can be used to purchase things 
that an ABLE account can pay for. Um, it might be purchasing a home, it might be um, paying for an education, it might be, um, there's, a, there's a big list. Um, and if you want more information about ABLE accounts, I would encourage you to contact myself after this or to reach out to a benefits counselor. And if we don't have that information, we can get you to a subject matter expert in ABLE accounts to kind of go into more depth. So I don't know if that answer, I fully answers that question um, without going down a rabbit hole of getting really complicated. But, and I'll send um, out some info on ABLE accounts too. Okay, great. I figured you guys had some too. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, so the fourth thing kind of ties into even the question that you just asked too with um, benefits counseling. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I, I have to say when I, this is a long, long time ago, when I finished my certification as a benefits counselor, I left the training, I flew back home, and I told my employer with tears that I was not going to be able to do the job because it was too complicated and I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> Um, as it turns out, I absolutely love the work, but um, there's a lot of information out there. And so part of being a benefits counselor is developing a network of what you could probably call subject matter experts in different areas to rely on them to help, to help the people that you're serving understand their benefits. So examples of where a benefits counselor might have a contact that they could share with you or they could help you navigate is in special needs trusts, that's a complicated one, in 529 college savings plans, and there's, there's a whole, um, Medicare could be another one, it's a wide, wide range of, um, of contacts that a benefits counselor might have or might work with to help you understand any one scenario that um, is for you or for someone that you support. So um, those again, I think those four bullets address some of those questions. It's not a full answer that we got in the pregame questions, but, um, but hopefully it'll encourage each of you that asked us to pursue um, meeting with a benefits counselor and finding out more information through them, through myself or through any of the other resources that you'll get here, so. All right. Oh, uh, oh yeah, there's another, another question I'll get to later on here. Okay, we have the how. Or see, we've got the what, the why, and now the when. And so the when to pursue benefits counseling, really anytime. Um, I can't promote it enough. Anytime you're considering employment, if you're considering education, you're considering employment, um, that's the best time to bring benefits counseling into that conversation. Um, if you are thinking about employment, you're thinking about education, you're starting a plan, with an employment provider. You wanna work on the, under the Ticket to Work program. Um, those are great times prior to seeking employment or education to um, start benefits counseling in that conversation and looking into getting that service. If you're in a job search right now and you haven't accessed benefits counseling, now is the time, yesterday was the time, get a benefits counselor part of the conversation. So when that job offer comes, you truly have an understanding of what that means for your benefit scenario. Uh, also, when you work with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, you want to access benefits counseling through them. DVR has benefits counseling on their fee schedule and they can pay for benefits counseling for you once you're determined eligible for voc rehab services. And so if you're working with voc rehab and that hasn't been part of your conversation, then make it part of your conversation because that's important, super important. If you've gotten a job offer, if you start tomorrow, if you start next week and you haven't accessed benefits counseling, again, get benefits counseling um, in the picture. You wanna know, you wanna have the truth, the full picture. Um, if you're currently working and you get a promotion uh, with COVID-19, we saw layoffs, we saw working extra hours in those essential services. If that's you, then have benefits counseling a part of your scenario as well, because we, you wanna know how those changes affect your benefits as well. And then transition aid students is just one population of many that should be accessing benefits counseling. But we bring that up because there's a few extra things that come along with 
um, being on benefits age 14 versus age 24 versus age 34. So that's an important group to reach as well. So again, when to pursue benefits counseling, anytime employment is a part of the conversation. All right, so that was the when. Now we gotta go to the how. Maybe the most important piece today and the piece I keep emphasizing the most. And this part, we're gonna get into some acronyms. And so don't let that scare you away. Hang in with me through this. We'll get the basics to you. And then we're gonna get you a resource to help explain it even more <laughs> or reiterate what I'm saying. Uh, so in our state, in all 50 states, we have access to CWICs and CPWICs. That's Community Work Incentive Coordinators or Community Partner Work Incentive Counselors. You don't need to know those terms, but there's a reason I bring them up and that's based on what they can do and how that service is paid for. So CWICs and CPWICs, that's who's gonna help you with benefits counseling. So how to access benefits counseling through CWICs. Again, Community Work Incentive Coordinators. Ability Connection Colorado, or ACCO for their acronym, is what's called the WIPA Project for Colorado. Again, WIPA Projects in all 50 states. WIPA stands for Work Incentives Planning and Assistance. Um, that is Social Security funded projects to provide benefits counseling. Remember I said Social Security recognizes the importance of benefits counseling. And so in all 50 states, they provide funding through, they named WIPA projects. In our state, that's Ability Connection Colorado. You will have all of their contact information from today's presentation. Their service is free. It's funded by Social Security, it's, so it's free. However, because Social Security funds it, Social Security gets to say who those counselors see. And they have a criteria and priority of service. We're not gonna go through their whole criteria and priority of service. It's gonna be on the handout that you get today. Um, but the most important point to make about the, this free service is that in order to access it, you do have to be eligible for SSI and or SSDI benefits. And that would include childhood disability benefits, which I mentioned before, as well as some of the others, survivors, widowers, um, I won't go into the list, but um, SSI and SSDI benefits. So that's for the WIPA projects and that's the CWICs. Now, what about the CPWICs? What's the difference? Um, I've listed the agencies here that, are, that have CPWICs in Colorado. Again, you'll get that list and all of their contact information um, on the handout that you get from today. Now, that service is paid for typically through the Division of Voc Rehab. Um, there's no um, uh, priority of service. There's no criteria um, set because they're not funded specifically by Social Security. Um, that service, like I said, is pay, can typically paid for through DVR, Division of Voc Rehab. Um, so you can private pay as well in some scenarios, and there's other options. I've seen employers pay for benefit counseling through some of these providers as well. So if you, if you wanna um, work with any of these agencies, before you write them off, if you're not a, a Voc Rehab, um, client, then contact that agency and see what options there might be. Again, there's no requirement here for a person to be on SSI or SSDI benefits or any combination. And so if you have, um, if you're on Medicaid and food stamps, but you're not on SSI or SSDI, then this, these would be the counselors that you would want to go see because they, um, they're not going to be limited. And all of those people, the CWICs, the CPWICs, those acronyms, they're all certified to provide benefits counseling. And that's super important. Um, as I've said a few times, I've been around a while, I've been around the block, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> um, and certification in this field means that that person has been tried, they've been tested, they have to maintain certification through continuing education. So they're up to date. All of our CWICs and CPWICs in our state are certified through Virginia Commonwealth University, and we all have to complete the same certification requirements. So even though we have different funding sources, even though we have different acronyms as a title or as a, a chunk of letters behind our name, 
Um, we all have to do the same certification requirements, and so we all have, we're all working with the same information. So that's how you're going to access benefits counseling. And that brings us to one more question that was that came from the pregame, the pregame questions. And that is, will accessing services from DVR affect my SSDI? And DVR, again, stands for Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance, since those acronyms aren't spelled out here for you. And then the, the statement that I can make is accessing DVR services does not have any direct effect, any effect on your SSDI payment or your SSDI eligibility. Now, in that conversation, there are some considerations to think about. And one of them is with SSDI and SSI eligibility, it actually means that you are presumed eligible for DVR services. And so in a sense that but your benefit is tied to DVR services in that way, but it doesn't have an effect on your payment amount or your eligibility for SSDI. And then there's some other work incentive programs that um, you could use with DVR that are tied back to your benefits. And that's the ticket to work program as well as a work incentive called Section 301. And there are other uh, work incentives as well. Those are two specifically tied to DVR. So I, I, those, that's why I pulled those out today. But um, just a couple of considerations that um, are related somewhat to that question. So I wanted to bring those up today. Now, for more information on benefits counseling within DVR, um, on DVR processes, benefits counseling processes, knows just as much as I do, um, you can reach out to Ann Christensen. She is the Benefits Counseling Program Coordinator with DVR. Um, you can also reach out to your DVR counselor. Um, they're going to know Ann as well, and Ann's email is here as well. So now, I've mentioned all those resources, all those people out there providing services. This is the document that you're going to walk away with today, and it's a Benefits Counseling Guide. And that's its title. You probably can't see that because that picture is a little small, but um, it's called a Benefits Counseling Guide. And it goes through the what and the when and then the how around benefits counseling. Basically what I've talked about today, it's on paper for you. And then when you get to the how, you're going to see all the names of certified benefits counselors in our state, their email and their phone numbers, and you can reach out directly to them as well. Now, Anything that comes on paper or anything that comes as a PDF document in your email, um, those can change, right? They're always updated. And this is always updated. We have updates as people get certified and as people um, leave, the, leave the business and, and, and things change. So to always make sure you have the updated guide, there is a link here uh, to the National APSE website. APSE is the Association of Persons Supporting Employment First. We won't go into to all of that meaning, but um, the National APSE website, the specific Colorado chapter is there, and that's where the most updated online version of this guide will always be as well. So you can always check there. And then ultimately, it will also be on our Employment First website once we get that launched. And that, again, is employmentfirstcolorado.org. It's just not up there as of today. So, all right, we're getting close on time. So we're getting close. Um, a couple of more things. How can you help a benefits counselor? Uh, like I said, we're working on increasing capacity uh, for benefits counseling. One of the things that's made benefits counseling change recently, of course, is COVID-19 and how services are delivered. And one of those ways of change is um, verification of benefits. And so um, everybody's working remotely still. Um, so if you meet with a benefits counselor, it's likely going to be over the phone or over Zoom um, or Google, Google Hangouts, uh, whatever, whatever format you choose or, or your, your uh, provider chooses. But um, benefits verifications have become more difficult with um, agencies not having staff in the office. So um, if you have benefit verifications at your house or on you or in a file cabinet somewhere, um, or you can get them directly yourself, you're going to help out a benefits counselor. So if you have those, gather those. Um, giving those to a benefits counselor can, can save them a step and save them time and save you time as well. So that's one way to help a benefits counselor. Also, another way is, is use your team and create a team approach to what is a scary endeavor, regardless of how much information, if it's change, 
it's new, it can be a scary endeavor. Involve your DVR counselor um, if you're working with DVR. Um, involve your parents, your siblings, your support team, whoever that might be. Have them learn about your benefits as well. And so um, you have a team approach to benefits counseling. Your benefits counselor can be a part of that team. And that's um, a way that everybody can work together and you know, take away a little bit of the scariness and um, information can be um, understood. And that means ask questions, ask lots of questions. It doesn't hurt to ask questions. Um, that, and those questions are gonna help you understand what you're hearing and about those benef your benefit situation or the person that you support. And it's gonna, if you ask a question, it's gonna help somebody else on your team also understand and ask a question too. So um, don't be afraid to ask questions. And asking questions, if, if we don't know the answer as benefits counselors, it's gonna be a way that we get to learn something new too. So, um, so don't be afraid to do that. The other thing I'll tell you to do is develop an organizational system for your paperwork. Um, whether it's electronic, whether it's uh, on a cloud, virtual, or whether it's on paper. Um, keep receipts, keep pay stubs, keep, um, if you think it's related to Social Security, keep it, put it in a file, and let your benefits counselor help you determine what's necessary and what's needed, um, because ultimately that stuff could play into and be an important piece of reporting income and getting using work incentives and those exclusions that I mentioned several slides ago. And then if you're supporting someone, assist them with reporting, remind them, help them develop a system as well, um, help promote what that benefits counselor is saying, <coughs> um, and, and really assist with reporting. Because like I said, none of this matters if you don't report income. And um, so we wanna stress the importance of that as well. And then lastly, you don't have to navigate this stuff alone. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning um, of the benefits counseling piece, mention it now. Like if this is your first exposure to benefits counseling and I'm getting into Medicaid buy-in and exclusions and work incentives and nine months with SSDI and work, blah, 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 all that stuff, it can be kind of overwhelming. Even if you have years and years of experience, you're the VR counselor on this call and you've been doing this job for 15 years. Um, I can tell you, you don't have to navigate benefits alone. And the individuals that are providing this service are in this stuff each and every day. And that's the only way that you know um, that you're gonna get the full information. Um, again, I've been doing this job a long time. And a lot of what's happening out there is people are out giving information, they're, they're, they're providing benefits counseling when really they're not fully informed, they're not certified, um, they haven't looked up the most recent stuff. And so that's what you have to be careful of. To avoid that, use the certified people that we have out there. Um, they're certified and trained. Those are the CWICs and CPWICs that I mentioned use them, work together to really peel back the layers of an individual's benefit scenario and to do research if it's needed to get the information that could ultimately have a huge impact on a job seeker's life. So with that, um, oops, I've got a final question slide. Um, I have one more question. I know we're short, are we short on time yet? Um, I, you know, we had, had one question from the pregame that I hadn't gotten to, but um, Shelby, can you tell me where we're at on time? Yeah, it is 1216. So we're one minute okay. over. So it's up to you if you want to answer questions. Otherwise, what I can do is I have some other questions. I can put them in a document and then have it sent out. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you have sent me a question in the chat or the q and I've seen those. I wanted to make sure Melanie got all the info, especially about how you access benefits counseling, because there were lots of questions coming in and I knew okay. that was coming. Um, so, so yeah, so I'll say thank you so much. I will send out a recording. I'll send out other resources. And then Melanie, if you want to say something more, I'm sure a few people will stay on. So up to you. Okay. I will just say one more just because, um, because there was a question in the pregame, I think I said I didn't get to because I wasn't sure of the context. And that was, the question was, do we have any idea on how long the overpayments of SSI or SSDI will continue? 
I'm not sure if that context is related to any changes that have happened with COVID-19 or um, if there's another context. So if that person's on the call, if you could um, just chat, Shelby, what your context is or elaborate on your question, that would be great. And then I will answer all the questions that came into the chat today um, and get those back to you, Shelby, for, um, for everybody to see. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. I'm really glad that you reached out and I'm hoping if you are a family or you're gonna work with someone who might be thinking about college, that this will kind of give you a sense that you have the option to work when you do go to college and hopefully it won't be so scary in terms of what happens with benefits. Um, and if any more questions come up, you can send them either to Melanie or send them to me. I can get them answered however you wanna go about it. Um, but, but just know this is an open door to more information if you want about benefits counseling. So thanks a bunch, everyone, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.